Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog presents our Summer of Carnage. And today we are gonna really kick things off because a couple days ago I was like, all right, I need to make a, or is that like a week ago now? I, I had to make a video, like a history on Carnage. I just wanted to do it. I don't know, I felt compelled to try something different. I know I did something similar to that with the Resident Evil videos, but I never got around to finishing those just because of time and everything else that was going on and then my health at that time. And I kind of abandoned them. Like I typically always run into that problem where I just overextend myself. And I said, you know, this time, I don't want to like drop the ball here. I actually want to do something different and make like a precursor for people out there who maybe aren't caught up on things Carnage or only remember him from Maximum Carnage and haven't kept up with him over the years. And I also like that running thread that's throughout the character of him basically dying and coming back or never being killed. Um, I kind of like that thread that's always been there with the character. I know that's typical in comics, but I like what Donny Cates did where he kind of is like, all right, let's take that and make it part of our story. Let's take the fact that this guy should have been killed multiple times and kind of did die a couple times. And uh, let's in a way explain why he's not dead and, and that he has a purpose here. And uh, and so I kind of like that he pulled that together and, and made that work. Uh, almost like in the way that Jeff Johns did with Black Hand uh, for Blackest Night. Uh, it seems like, you know, Cletus Cassidy is kind of, you know, in a way where he's going to become the Grendel, where he's turning into the Grendel. We'll get into that here in a second. Uh, but uh, Cletus Cassidy seems essential to Null in the way that Black Hand was essential to um, Necron in the Green Lantern storyline that Jeff Johns did. So in that similarity there, I'm like, oh, I kind of like that, though. I think it gives uh, Cletus even more of a purpose than just being the crazy guy who kills everybody um, and adds like uh, maybe a little bit something to his character but I also want to see him maybe turn the tide uh, I don't see Cletus Cassidy as someone who will uh, ultimately fully give himself to Null he seems like uh, too much of a wild card to ever really do that so I'm kind of curious to see if that you know other shoe's going to drop and maybe he turns against Null in some way um, so we'll see we'll see what happens but uh, absolute carnage here I wanted to you know get into this and I wanted to make that video as a pre cursor uh, for this video, uh, but obviously we had movie news come out this week, so I went ahead and did that for you real quick, and now we're here with a review, not a discussion. So this might not be that long of a video, and there will be some spoilers. And normally this is where I give out the digital code, uh, but actually I couldn't get to a comic store this week uh, because I didn't have any money. I had some Amazon credit, so I was able to buy the digital copy of Absolute Carnage, but I haven't been able to buy a physical copy. So when we do our discussion video, like in a week or, or when we get to it, um, I, or an upcoming episode at some point, I will give away a digital copy of this comic book. So I don't have one here, uh, but we are gonna talk about mild spoilers for the most part, um, and I'm maybe towards the end too, uh, I don't know yet, I'm just going to kind of free, you know, wing it like I normally do. So uh, if I would say if you haven't read this book, go pick it up. It's $7.99. I know that seems like a steep price point, uh, and it is in a lot of ways in comic books nowadays, but you pretty much get three comic book links of story in here. Um, it's it's divided up into three 20-page chapters, uh, so you get 60 pages of story and Ryan Stegman art. Uh, so for $7.99, I'm not against that for 60 pages of story and art, because a normal comic book is three or you know, $3.99 or $4.99, and you only get 20 five pages of art, you know, at the most, uh, of story and art. So this is nice. It's twice that for a little bit less than the price. So, um, you know, a little bit over twice that actually. So this book is written by Donny Cates, who, you know, I've been critical of, uh, of his run so far. There are still things in this book that I have some nitpicks and, and critiques on. Uh, but for the most part, I thought he crushed it on this book. I thought Donny Cates really brought his A game here and working with Ryan Stegman and Ryan Stegman's art. This is some of the best art of his career. And he was already turning in that, that level of art on the Venom Monthly book book but this is just to a whole new level i mean scenes in this book genuinely look scary and uh, and i like that a lot i was like wow this really feels like a horror story especially in the third act or the third part of this book it feels very much like a horror story um, and then we have Inks by J.P. Meyer, uh, who's doing a really great job, uh, always does great work, uh, but even here, uh, adding the depth and level of it, because what's cool about this version, the digital copy that I bought for $7.99, you can get on Amazon or Comixology, um, the cool thing about the, the director's cut version is what they call it, and they don't charge you anything extra for it, and it's like 380 pages or 365 pages of digital pages, um, because they put in the background, or in the back, like an extras section, and in that extra section is all the pencils from every page, then the inked versions by JP, and then the colored versions by Frank Martin. Um, that is amazing. I thought that was great, an ex a nice extra for uh, for no extra cost for buying the digital one. I thought that was phenomenal, and I hope Marvel keeps doing that with their director cuts one, because I think they did that for House of X also. They added a bunch of special features in the back, and they didn't charge you anything extra for it. So that, I think, is fantastic, and hopefully Marvel keeps that up. So if you want 
pick up the digital copy uh, because there's a lot of extras in the back. There's a, a gallery of all the different variant covers and there's even the full script of issue one all packaged together in essentially a graphic novel size file uh, that you can download for $7.99 on Comixology or, or on Amazon. Um, and then the lettering was done by uh, VCs Clayton Cowles, uh, uh, edited by Devin Lewis, and Nick Lowe is the executive editor, and Danny Chasm is the assistant editor on this book. And as far as editing goes, I mean, this book is very well paced. Obviously, it's hard to pick on some things because I'm sure they're going to pan out later uh, and, and matter more later. Uh, so so we, I won't you know nitpick on some of those little things that I was thinking about. Uh, main thing I saw some people complain about was that this book came out the same week as the Power Pack book came out called Future Foundation. And there's the makers in this book. And then there's a different version of the maker in that book. And uh, to me, I'm, I mean, I'm not reading that book, so I don't care. Uh, but I understand on an on a editing level, there used to be a time where if a, a, a character was represented in one way here, they would be over here. And I would say over the last like 15, 20 years, uh, that's kind of reduced. And now people are like, oh, this is my version of Two-Face. And it's like, okay, well, over here, this is my version of Two-Face. Um, and they've done that a lot throughout comics. So I guess it doesn't bother me as much anymore. I do wish stuff like that would be focused on more and paid attention to more. But ultimately, if you have different tones for different books and you think that character is the perfect character for that book, but it's a different take than someone else's, I mean, ultimately, you got to go with that. I mean, that's part of the business of, of doing comics is it happens sometimes. So I don't have any uh, nitpicks as far as editing goes because I think the storyline is really tight. It's really well paced. It starts off, it has this great intro. Um, the first chapter is called The Bleeding King and has this intro by um, Eddie Brock. And he's telling us, uh, the audience, but really he's telling his son, Dylan, uh, who still doesn't know is his son. Uh, he's telling Dylan, about what's going on. All right, here's what's happening. Uh, Carnage has been resurrected. Uh, he's out there somewhere, and you know, and uh, and he's like, you know, g gathering these codexes. He's trying to rebuild himself as the Grendel, and uh, he's going to awaken Null. And Null, the, the planet of the Symbiotes is actually not a planet. It's a giant cage, and it's trapped Null inside, and it's locked. You know, as long as all those Symbiotes are around him, he's locked in the darkness, and he can't get out. But Cletus Cassidy, for some reason, or somehow, we're going to find out soon, I'm sure, is the key to that lock. And he's going to, some, you know, in some way, release Null upon the universe again. And so that's what he's kind of informing uh, Dylan on. And Dylan's like freaked out by it. He's like, holy crap, that's, uh, that's pretty heavy stuff. So as they're on the run in the beginning, they go up to Times Square and they see that Eddie Brock has been framed for murder. So obviously this is happening right after the free comic book day issue, which we talked about before, where um, Cletus Cassidy disguises himself as Eddie Brock. He can fully shapeshift now with the, the way his suit works and stuff. And uh, he looks like Eddie Brock. He goes into jail. He like he tampers around Avengers you know, mansion for some reason. He's just doing it to get captured. He goes to jail. And then from there, he like kills Lee Price, who is a former uh, Venom, you know, a host of Venom. And he rips the codex out of his spine and kills him. And, uh, and he frames Eddie Brock for it. So now everyone's on the hunt for Eddie Brock. And again, I had a critique of, well, why do that? Like, what does it matter? Because ultimately, you know, Noel is going to destroy the world anyway. And everyone's going to get turned into symbiotes or whatever and under his control. So what's the purpose of even framing Eddie Brock? They try to set that up here. And again, I think it that plot line still doesn't work for me uh framing eddie still doesn't buy you really anything in the storyline except at the beginning here where him and dylan come across times square and they see wanted most wanted man in new york right now he killed someone at a prison and escaped the prison everybody needs to find him be on the lookout blah 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 and uh and that plays in one scene and then it doesn't really play for the rest of the book it doesn't really matter uh for the most part so uh, or kind of with john jameson at the end but but not really so eddie brock is now you know, in the subway, he has Dylan. They're being chased by somebody, like wearing a uh, like a trench coat and a hat. And Eddie's like, "Let's get out of here." Someone's following us. They get down the subway, and uh, someone just like the, one of the first appearances of Venom, where uh, we, you know, before Venom fully appeared, there was these moments where he was tormenting Peter Parker, and he pushed Peter Parker out in front of a, a train, and Peter Parker almost died, and his spider sense didn't go off, and uh, he was like, "Oh crap! Whatever enemy this is, they found a way around my spider sense." And that was like the build up to revealing Venom in Amazing Spider-Man 300. So I always like that they yeah, you know that moment those moments and we talked about those moments on the show before so they replicate this moment here i thought donnie cates and ryan stegman i thought that was really clever actually uh to see that happen where uh eddie's on the subway they're waiting for the train to come and they're like all right this guy's following us what's going to happen and then cletus cassidy appears behind him and pushes him and Dylan out in front of the train and, uh, you know, trying to kill them. And then the suit, that was the thing in the trench coat with the hat on, it was following Eddie and it comes to Eddie's rescue and turns them into Venom again and uh, bonds with him. And right before he does, it stops the train and kind of derails it and stops it from killing Eddie Brock. But who knows how many people it killed on the actual train. And when trains derail under a subway, 
Typically, the cars fold in and crush everyone that's on the platform, too. That didn't really happen here. So, you know, I'm not trying to add, like, reality to this or anything like that. But still, like, you kind of wonder, like, uh, part of your brain wonders, like, well, did the suit save Eddie but just kill, like, 100 people and wound, like, you know, 100 more or something? Uh, you just can't help but, you know, take your mind there sometimes. But they don't really brush on it because then Carnage shows up. And he's ready to kill, uh, you know, Dylan and Venom now because Eddie's like, hey, wait, I can hear you in my head because you remember uh, previous issues before War of the Realms, uh, Eddie and the, the suit, th their minds were like at, at war with each other and they couldn't really hear each other sometimes. And so what happened was after or during War of the Realms, if you read War of the Realms and if you haven't, we covered it on the show, but definitely go pick it up in the main War of the Realms book the Venom symbiote gets taken by Malekith and then the brainwashing, whatever was wrong with it with Null and its connection to Null got kind of erased. And now it has a clear mind and it sees that carnage is coming. It sees what's going on. It's got the, the its original genetic memories back. And now it's coming back to New York to rebond with Eddie and help prepare him for carnage. And it gets there right at the nick of time because carnage shows up in his new body, towering. He's like, you know, 10 feet tall. He's actually towering over Venom, which looks amazing. The artwork is so phenomenal. And uh, Eddie and, and him fight. And then and of course, Eddie gets away. I'm not going to reveal every little detail about this book, but Eddie does get away, but he gets wounded severely. And they decide to go recruit because uh, basically Eddie's like, look, if we're going to survive this, I need to go to the one person who, even though I hate him, uh, is probably the most responsible person. I have a son to look out for. Um, and there's a, you know, a big battle coming and I don't have a lot of allies, but I think this guy, we, maybe we can find a common enemy here um, in Carnage and maybe he'll help me out. And then they go and track down Peter Parker. And basically the whole second part of this book, which is called uh, Part Two, The Godson, which is a reference obviously to Normie, which we he's going to get brought into the story later on, uh, is Peter and, uh, and, and Eddie come in two terms like basically like all right let's uh, let's settle this let's let's uh, talk this out and eddie fills peter in on what's going on and peter's like dude you're fighting gods and like a super carnage now like whatever happened to fun things like drillers underneath san francisco and like uh, you know dinosaurs and stuff in the sewers like why why don't you do fun things anymore and i was like oh i like that it's like a nice meta reference to the new direction that they're taking Eddie Brock in and how over in over his, his head he is. You know, like he, Donnie Cates did a really good job with that. When I when I first started this new direction, I liked the first issue because it was on a street level, but it quickly got to a bigger level that I thought maybe was just too big for Venom. But I like that they addressed that and they're like, no, it is, you know, and that's why he's reaching out for help now. Uh, and especially with the stakes even higher now that he has a son, he feels there is something for him to lose now. And it's trying to make him think and act differently than he probably would have been, you know, thinking before. Before. Uh, so whereas he would be more selfish before now he's not and I like that I actually got to say I've always liked in this book like with Donnie Cates he had some great ideas uh, throughout the Venom run but there's some continuity things that I've always railed against but in this one I felt like he embraced a lot of the continuity and that made me feel good I was like oh great like maybe he's you know he heard some of that feedback or maybe he just in general was like hey I, I do want to pay attention to continuity and I'm and I'm you know got more of it to reference in this story than I've had in other stories and that may be the case too because he references uh, An Angelo Fortunato. So, uh, you know, Peter and Eddie are talking and Eddie's like, you know, hey, Dylan, why don't you go let me and Spider-Man talk? Because they're just sitting in a bar and Eddie's as Eddie and Spider-Man, you know, Peter's dressed as Spider-Man. But it's weird because earlier these cops showed up when Eddie was fighting Carnage and they saw Eddie and they're like, freeze, Eddie Brock, you're a murderer. And he's like, it's not me. Just take the boy and get out of here. And it's like, that's the only thing that framing Eddie Brock bought you, uh, well, you know, was, was that he was, you know, a gun was aimed at him by a cop who recognized him, but really that cop could have still aimed a gun. You don't need the, you know, that Eddie Brock was framed. You don't need that story for a cop to see a train derailed and then aim a gun at the guy who did it. Um, so to me, like, again, that little framing of Eddie Brock thing, it doesn't I don't see the purpose of it still um, so and, and even more in this scene because Eddie Brock is just sitting in a bar with Spider-Man you would think all eyes would be on them and no one's really paying too much attention to them until Eddie starts yelling but nobody's going hey that's Eddie Brock the most wanted man in New York so you're kind of like all right so what was the point of framing him again if it's gonna be like that so again those are just little nitpicks of course uh, they didn't really take me out of the story too much uh, because I like the, the dialogue here. I thought Peter and Eddie talking here was really great. And when Peter realizes that Dylan is Eddie's son, he says, look, take it from someone who grew up without knowing his father. Tell that kid you're his dad. Please just do it. And Eddie's like, you're right. When the time comes, I will do it. And I thought that was fantastic. Really great character moments there uh, between the two and really thinking 
and putting yourself as a writer into the character of Spider-Man and, and going, what would Peter say? What kind of advice would Peter give in this situation? And I thought, you know, they nailed it. Donnie Cates nailed it. And the art with Ryan Stegman, even though it's just people sitting at a table, which I always kind of poke fun at in their run because they, they have this theme of caged. And there's so there's a lot of times where people are sitting in chairs. Uh, but to me, this one worked because it was just two guys connecting, telling each other their stories and learning more about each other. And that, to me, worked fine. Um, but then on the news, they, there's this big crater in New Jersey where all these dead bodies have been piled in. And the news reporter comes on and says there's Angel Fortunato, which is the person who was very briefly bonded to the Venom symbiote when Venom found out his cancer was too bad for the suit to cure anymore. And he basically auctioned off the suit. And Angelo's father was the one who bought it for Angelo to try to toughen up his son because his son was like a mob kid, but his son was a kind of a weakling and he wanted to toughen his son up. So he bought the Venom symbiote and, uh, and gave it to his son. And so, but then the suit abandoned him quickly and then went to my, Matt Gargan, uh, the scorpion. So he's, his body is found dead. Um, uh, the, the Life Foundation people, Donna Diego, I think they said they found her body. Uh, and then General Thunderbolt Ross, uh, you know, the, you know, the guy who hunted down the Hulk for many years, who became the Red Hulk, and who also bonded briefly with the symbiote before, I think, in the Thunderbolts run, which we'll get into in season four. Um, so all these people are found dead. And that's when Eddie goes you know, Spider-Man, like he's like, he jumps up out of the table, starts yelling. He's like, guys, shut up, shut up. He's telling everyone in the bar to shut up. And he's like, and then the guy turns the channel. He goes, no, 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 turn it back, turn it back. He's like, come on, man, we're a bar and a restaurant. Like people are eating. I don't want them to see piles of dead bodies on the screen. And he's like, no, he's like, you don't understand. And, and Peter's like, dude, calm down. Why are you he's like, why are you getting so upset? He's like, don't you see that's a, that's from Cletus. Cletus is telling us like all those bodies, they have one thing in common. Their spines have been ripped out. The codexes on their bodies have been sucked out. And those are all dead bodies. People that knew me and had the symbiote part of them at one point. And, and you know, Spider-Man's like, it's, it's okay, we'll figure it out. And then he goes, don't you understand? That means Annie is there. And that moment broke me. Like when I read that, I was like, oh boy, because that is tr tremendous weight. Obviously for those who watch the Venom movie, you know, Anne Weighing is, you know, the, the woman that, you know, M Eddie Brock was in love with. Uh, in the comics, they were married, they got divorced. It turns out she had a kid and didn't tell Eddie about it. And that is Dylan. So not only is that important to Eddie, that Anne's body is in there somewhere, um, but also to Dylan and Dylan doesn't know. And Dylan's like, who's Annie? And it, when Eddie hears that, he is breaking. He is, he is, his soul is rattled. And I thought that moment was handled so freaking well because there's this whole panel of just silence, of just Eddie crying. And I was like, this is, talk about bringing the emotion here. I thought it was awesome. And I felt like that was a big tribute to a lot of stuff and also a setup. I think that big pile of bodies is not just there for that reason. I think some of the spinoff books are probably going to spawn out of that. Um, and I have no doubt in my mind, like I talked about before, because I referenced Green Lantern a lot and Jeff Johns' Green Lantern run. I think Donnie Cates pulls a lot of his ideas in a way or like pays tribute in some way or whatever uh, to that run um, by, you know, by mirroring it in some ways. And I think Noel, we already seen him bring back, you know, like the, the cult and everything brought back Cletus Cassidy. They brought back the Sin Eater in the last issue of uh, Venom. And I think they're going to bring back the dead, much like Necron did in Blackest Night. I think we're going to see that come back and we're going to see Annie get resurrected at some point. And that is going to be just heartbreaking and dark and twisted. Um, so anyway, so Spider-Man says, look, we need to find someone who can make a machine. I know Reed Richards, maybe he can make a machine that can separate the codex from people without killing them. And, and Eddie's like, don't go to Reed Richards. I don't, they, they're not going to trust me. They're not going to, you know, help me out but I know someone who will. And he goes to the maker who is an alternate universe, Reed Richards. He brings Spider-Man there and says, yeah, this is, you know, Reed Richards. And Spider-Man's like, oh my God, Reed Richards. Like, dude, if you're half as smart as our Reed Richards, then I have no problem. Like, this is going to be great. And he's like, yeah, sure. And he goes, uh, and he goes, who'd you bring? And he's like, you know, Spider-Man. I saw some people complaining like, oh, Spider-Man tells the maker that, that normie is his godson. It's like, well, godson isn't like nephew. Like, so it's not like a, you can instantly go, oh, you're the, you know, you're the godson of Spider-Man. That makes you Peter Parker. But if you're like, oh, you're the nephew of someone, you could deduce it easier. Godson is a title that can, you know, godfather and godmother can be given to friends and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's not hard to figure out, but also you can imagine Reed Richards from another universe knew who Peter Parker was. He knew in his universe that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. So that's not really a, a identity reveal uh, for him. Cause I'm sure Reed's like, yeah, you're probably just Peter Parker. And this Reed doesn't care. Like the maker doesn't care about secret identity. So that's another thing. He's just like, I don't 
and whatever. He goes, but 25 days ago before I met you, uh, Eddie Brock, um, because I thought Flash Thompson was still Venom, he's like, I built this machine to separate the Codex uh, from the people because his group, the people that Maker is working for, they want to study these Codexes. They want to study the Grendel and they want to figure out what makes it tick. So they've already been planning for this. So he's like, hey, look, I already built a machine that does that. He's like, and I'm nearly complete on it, uh, but we got to do a test run. And they're like, well, so Spider-Man's like, well, I brought my nephew, Nor or my godson, Normie. He goes, because uh, Normie was once like a goblin child, a red goblin child. And he's like, yeah, but I don't know if the machine will work or hurt him. We should test it on somebody who you're probably not, you're probably okay with getting hurt so I can perfect it and we can do it better with Normie. And so they look at it, you know, Eddie and, uh, and Peter kind of look at each other and go, we may know a guy, and then it cuts to Ravencroft uh, Institute, where this is where part three takes place, and uh, and in Ravencroft, uh, the, th the third part is called The Long Red Dark, and, uh, and this is where they basically, it's a buddy story where they break into Ravencroft. They use John Jameson to help him out. There's a cool twist there. I'm not going to say it here, but I did guess it right. If you watch my old videos where I talked about Cult of Carnage, I pretty much called this coming from a couple months ago, uh, but I thought it was pretty obvious, so I don't feel like I should win any no prizes for that. I think it was pretty obviously done in the story, but you get a John Jameson cameo here, and he's turning into Man Wolf. There's some cool twist there. Like I said, I don't want to spoil everything, uh, but then they go in to try to break out Norman Osborn, and there is insanity ensues, and Cletus shows up. He's singing a song. He's trans furring his uh, you know he's ripping out little bugs in him and he's giving them to the inmates there and he's turning them into symbiote creatures as well and he's building himself an army that's what carnage always does he always likes to build himself a family a surrogate family for the one he never had and uh and he's doing it here again uh and it's just really creepy and i don't want to talk about any more about the third act of this book because i don't want to spoil anything but it's really great and man did they hit the ground running with this one and the art by stegman is amazing because this last 20 pages is like a straight up horror story spider-man and Eddie Brock in an insane asylum uh, with John Jameson and Norman Osborn and Cletus Cassidy and a bunch of symbiote inmates. It's fantastic. Go pick it up. Um, so overall, like I got to say, this book really shook me on an emotional level. I like the references to continuity. This is the kind of stuff I would, you know, wanted Donny Cates to do throughout his run is take some of his really good ideas, which I've always thought he had some really good ones, but then meld it with things that have existed as opposed to trying to take full credit for things in a way. And I, I'm not saying he did do that. It just came across that way in some of his writing and, and stuff that he just was like, putting a pin on like, this is my stamp, this is my stamp. And this I felt like was a perfect marriage of the things that were. So fans who have been reading for 30 years are like, wow, okay, I get that. I understood that reference. I understood that reference, you know, that Captain America meme. Um, but then, you know, but also marrying it to his current ideas and where he wants to take the story. And I felt like this was a perfect blend of that. And so for that reason, I got to give Absolute Carnage a four and a half out of five. Uh, that is my final review score. I thought it was that good and uh i and for the price point too because i factor in that i factor in you know the art the coloring and i would say if you can if you already own the physical copy that's great uh but also and check out make sure you follow donny cates and ryan stegman see where they're going to be what conventions what stores they sign at make sure you get it signed too uh because a lot happens in this issue and i think it's definitely going to go down as long as the next four issues are on this level this will go down as probably one of the best uh, carnage stories out there um you know and and probably people 20 years from now or 15 years from now might have fondness of this the way that some of us have of maximum carnage even though that storyline is is not the greatest story but it was a lot of fun and we have a lot of fond memories of it maybe one day someone you know people will have fond memories of this in that way and that's awesome and that puts it up there with some of the great marvel stories uh, out there and it makes it a really good event like it's this is starting off to be a solid event and to you know smack eddie brock right in the middle of a Marvel Comics event. I mean, I don't know, as a Marvel fan and as a Eddie Brock fan, and as someone who hosts this show, I don't know if I could have asked for more. And I think it's done really well here. So I want to hear your thoughts. What did you think of this? What's your rating out of five stars? Let me know in the comments down below. Did you read it? If you haven't, you know, hopefully you watch this video and I didn't spoil too much for you. Go pick it up yourself. And like I said, if you can, buy the digital copy because there's a lot of extra features in there that are really cool. If you want to see what a script looks like, a comic book script looks like, uh, you know, from Donny Cates, check it out the way he describes things. Uh, he even makes Watchmen references in his scripts and stuff uh, because each chapter title has like the, the spider, the Venom logo go but it's like bleeding like blood's going down it and it kind of is reminiscent of uh, the watchman stuff with the you know the the smiley badge and stuff and the blood on it so i don't know it's pretty cool there's little things like that but then also there's the cover gallery with all the variant covers uh, are in the back of the book here and then also um all the pencils 
inks and color versions of each page of this book. How insane is that? So yeah, it makes it to be like a 365 page file for $7.99. That's the price of a graphic novel. Uh, even in digital form, it's cheaper than most graphic novels. And it's a hefty read and a lot to examine and look at. So maybe we'll do another episode coming up on the special features of this from the director's cut. But for now, that's my review and I'd love to hear your thoughts. So let me know down in the comments below. What'd you think of Absolute Carnage number one? Thanks for watching my video as always. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you all in the future. Peace.